All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Lisa Ames, uh, and I'm going to get started on our uh, my my talk here on general entomology and insect identification resources. Um, there will be a couple updates uh, for any of you have who have seen this talk previously. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some good information for you. Um, what we're mainly going to be talking about today is uh, why we need basic entomology, how that helps with identification, and for getting ready uh, for uh, identification and not only identification but control and also some identification resources that can help with some of this basic entomology and identification. All right, why basic entomology? Well, uh, basic entomology helps us in quite a few different ways. Uh, first, identification can be easier with some knowledge of basic entomology, and that's because morphology and physiology is, uh, is used in a lot of the classification that we use, even some of the larger forms of classification, uh, such as order and family. Also, understanding basic entomology is helpful in implementing good IPM practices. Uh, this can help in a variety of ways. Uh, the first is, in, is the insect a pest variety? And does the insect do the damage that you're seeing? Uh, in a lot of cases, I get insect damage, and then uh, I get, especially from homeowners, I get an insect uh, that doesn't have the correct type of mouth parts or isn't the correct type of insect to do the damage. Uh, that the people have thought that it might be doing. And that's important to know with your basic entomology how it can help you out uh, in, in identify, being able to identify those kind of circumstances. For example, here we'll start off with an example. And uh, we have here um, a bug and we have some damage. Uh, you can see the damage over here. I've got that marked. And based on what you can see from this insect, the question would be, uh, would this insect be capable of doing the damage that's being shown here? And in this case, uh, the answer would be no. Uh, first of all, uh, this insect is a bug. Uh, you can tell that but based on the mouth parts that are shown here, uh, that it has piercing sucking mouth parts. And in general, piercing sucking insects do not do the kind of damage where you actually have tearing of tissue. And also knowing a little bit more, and this is a little bit more complex, but actually knowing that these mouth parts are, are thicker, even though this is a bug, this is actually a predatory bug and actually isn't a, an insect pest at all. It's actually a helpful, beneficial insect. So we have some insect basics to start with. First of all, and this has actually changed in the, in the last little bit, uh, we have actually a new class of critters. Uh, our springtails here are now class Columbula, uh, and we also have class Insecta. So now we have two classes that we need to deal with rather than the original first just Insecta. Um, and these are both in the phylum Arthropoda. And this includes spiders, horseshoe crabs, crustaceans, millipedes, and centipedes, all of which except for horseshoe crabs can also be sent in for identification and can be considered pest species at some point. Uh, the class Columbula, uh, even though it also has the same things as the class Insecta, where it's distinguished by the three segmented body parts, and what I mean by that is it has three body parts, and each of these body parts have segments to them. Uh, they have three pairs of legs and one pair of antenna. Uh, the Columbulans have been broken out. Uh, they have a ventral tube. Uh, actually, springtails are quite interesting in that they're fairly uh, diverse. Uh, we have springtails that have springs. And then we have actually springtails that don't have springs or have very reduced springs. Uh, so uh, we're going to, I will be giving a, a website later on where you can take a look at springtails in a little bit more detail if you ever need to identify them and want to know what they look like. Now here are the insect body parts. There are three, as we mentioned before. It has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And the interesting part is that the, uh, the thorax and the head are where most of the attachments to the insect body occur. Uh, and for the head, it's the eyes and the mouth. Uh, the abdomen does have the ovipositor and the genitalia. Uh, the thorax, however, has most of the attachments that are of importance. It has the legs and the wings. Uh, this is not always easy to tell, especially in insects such as, um, as beetles. When you turn beetles over, Oftentimes it looks like some of the legs are associated with the abdomen because the thorax and the abdomen are so closely related. 
And there can also be spaces in between the first two legs and the last leg. In fact, that's one of the, reason, one of the things that's used in characterization uh, for some of the different families of beetles. However, all of the legs are associated with the, with the thorax, and that's important to remember when looking at some kinds of identification thing. Now, insect identification, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is partly grouped by the morphological characters. And that's how the insect looks. Uh, and they're very important, at least these three things, especially the number and the appearance of the wings, uh, the appearance of the mouth parts, which are also important for other things besides identification, and the appearance of the antenna and the legs. Here's a good example. Uh, we have how the insect looks. And here are the wings, and especially we know in this case that we have a fly because it, even though it looks a little bit like a wasp in terms of its coloration, uh, as you can see here, it's got that wasp coloration, you can tell that it is a fly because it only has two pairs of wings. Also important for flies, uh, the wing venation is extremely important in terms of identification, and it's one of the main characters that I use when I'm trying to identify a fly. Wings can also be important in that uh, wings can be modified, and that sometimes can also help in identification. In this case here, uh, we have what used to be a homoptera and has now been put back into the hemiptera class. Uh, I mean, not class, the order hemiptera. Uh, and for this insect, we have one pair of wings uh, that's used for flight, and we have one pair of modified wings that covers over the other pair of wings, protecting it. And these modifications can often be used in identification. In this case, we know this is a thorn bug because its, wings, its outer wings have been modified into the shape of a thorn. Uh, we can also tell, uh, based on the wings, some, how to identify a bug from a beetle. In this case, we have a bug. And this is very important because bugs can often be confused with beetles, which we'll talk about later. Uh, it's very important, however, to note, to note that this uh, is a bug because it has this membrane here. The, it has the, the, the hemi light turned on top and it has this membrane. And actually this membrane tells us uh, that we have a special kind of plant bug. Uh, we, have a we have a plant bug, we have a myridae here, not just a bug. Uh, so in the case of, of identification, wings can be very important for not just telling you what, what particular uh, order you have, but even sometimes down to what family you have based on the wings. Also, mouth parts can be very important. Uh, in this case, we know we have a bug, as I mentioned earlier from our previous bug, uh, because we have piercing, sucking mouth parts. Now, the interesting thing about in this case is not only do we know that we have a bug, but in this case, because of the fatness and the thickness of the, of the beak, we can tell that this is a predatory bug. Of course, also the fact that it's feeding on a caterpillar helps uh, to tell you that this is a predatory bug, even though the appearance of the bug it looks an awful lot uh, like a stink bug, a brown stink bug that you might find feeding on a plant. Uh, it's important to know the difference of this because uh, if we have a predatory stink bug, this is actually a helpful creature rather than a harmful one. Mouth parts can also tell us other things. Uh, and in this case, we have chewing mouth parts. Uh, this is actually a fritillary caterpillar. And we can tell that they have chewing mouth parts because of the, the, the arrow here that points out uh, the modified parts of the mouth that allow it to chew. Uh, this is important. Uh, and in this case, uh, <laughs> Sid Mola says he's wondering if he's enjoying that. Yes, he sure is. This is my garden. Actually, fortunately, I planted these for him to eat, <laughs> which is good. And he is actually protected uh, from wasps by these spines on his back, which is good because I have lots of wasps that like to eat my caterpillars in my garden. Uh, the important thing to note about this, however, is not only does he have uh, chewing mouth parts, but in this case, this particular insect, in which we'll get into this uh, a little bit in a little bit, has a lifestyle that means that it's going to change into something completely different when it's an adult, in which case the mouth parts will be totally different. So it's important to realize that if you have a larval insect, the adults may or may not have the same kind of mouth parts when they become an adult. and may, not, may or may not have the same mouth parts as a, a larva does. And this can be very important for control, for control purposes. 
Now, in addition to having useful mouth parts, uh, insects can also have mouth parts that don't have much, uh, much use at all. In this case, we have an adult neuropteran, and these are mouth parts of the, uh, of the male, and the, they're used mainly just for looks and for maybe potentially fighting and attracting a mate. The female does not have these uh, modified uh, mouth parts. Uh, the adult does not eat at this point. Uh, the mouth parts are strictly for decoration in this case or for defending, look for uh, defending in terms of getting a mate. Uh, mouth parts aren't the only, even though mouth parts are the most important, uh, one of the most important things for identification, they're not the only important things for identification. Uh, we also look a little bit for, even though it's kind of secondary, uh, the antenna can be important for identification. Uh, here we have a longhorn beetle, and actually we can tell it's a longhorn beetle because of the fact that it has these really long antenna. Uh, the unfortunate thing is not all longhorn beetles have antenna this long. Some of them actually have them shorter, uh, so it's not necessarily a, a characteristic of the longhorn beetle. However, if you have a beetle with an antenna this long, that generally means that, yes, you have a longhorn beetle. Sometimes you can even tell the sex of an insect based on the antenna. Here we have a male moth, so that you can tell uh, this is a male moth by the modified feathery antenna, uh, and that will help you to identify the fact that this is a male and not a female moth, because female moths do not usually have this kind of antenna. Uh, antenna are not as useful in identification. However, uh, they also, in addition to beetles, uh, they're also important for identifying ants, because you'll have the elbowed antenna. Um, Legs can also be helpful, although less important in most cases for identification. It can give you an idea what the insect is doing. Uh, here we have a Katie did here. So we have these large jumping legs that let you know that this is, that's what he's mostly known for. That's what mostly does. However, there are some insects, such as the leaf-footed bug, uh, where the leg can actually be characteristic. All right, Sarah Smith said that uh, Linwood uh, wanted to let me know that he's trying to log on, but his password expired. All right, uh, he can fix that. Uh, if he doesn't get in, this is, will be archived, so he will be able to, uh, to go ahead and, and do the archive of this talk of anything that he's missed. So if you could tell him that, Sarah, that would be great. Um, in this case, uh, back to my leaf-footed bug here, the leaf, the expansion on the leg here actually does help you to identify that this is uh, a leaf-footed bug, because there are actually some insects that look a little bit like this. In fact, some of your predatory um, rabdidid, what we call rabdididae, uh, look like this, except they do not have the expanded leg, and that's one of the ways you tell the difference. Now, in addition to how the insect looks, uh, insects are in their grouped into their identification uh, by also by how the insect grows, some some of their physiological characters, and this mostly boils down to the type of metamorphosis the insect goes through. Now, this is extremely uh, this is probably much more complicated than I'm making it, but in terms for identification, it's mostly important to know two basic insect insect types of metamorphosis. And these are, and this refers to the way in which the insect goes through its life cycle from egg to adult. The two basic types are simple metamorphosis, and in this case, the insect does not go through um, a resting or pupal stage between the younger version and the older version. And then we have the complete metamorphosis, where the insect actually goes into a resting state and changes what, how it can potentially change how it looks entirely. Uh, when it goes through the pupil stage, and that's called complete metamorphosis. There is a, there are a few variations on simple metamorphosis, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but for the most important cases, uh, what we need to know is that the insect starts out uh, as an egg, and it goes through a small nymph and a larger nymph and a larger nymph, and then it becomes an adult. The adult can look just like the nymph except larger and including uh, say, reproductive organs and things like that that help it to lay eggs and mate. Or the adult might have wings when it gets to its last stage. And here are a couple of examples. Here we have a, a simple metamorphosis where the adult doesn't have wings. And these are very commonly found. Uh, here we have, uh, here we have, a, have, on this over here, we have a silverfish. 
the interesting thing about the silverfish is not only does it it look the, very similar except larger, just larger when it's an adult, a silverfish will actually continue to molt after it reaches the adult stage. Uh, my theory is because the silverfish are uh, such long-lived creatures, many species can live up to seven years, uh, and they're kind of delicate. If you've ever tried to collect a silverfish, they squash fairly easily. So for me, their outside covering isn't necessarily very hardy. So it could be in order for them to have such a long, uh, such a long uh, life cycle, um, they actually need to continue to reproduce as an adult to fix uh, their any problems they might have with their exoskeleton. Now, springtails, as we mentioned, are not necessarily insects anymore. They're in their own group, uh, but they still go through a simple metamorphosis very similar to uh, the, the more similar insects. Uh, here we have a typical springtail where we actually do have springs on, on, on the rear end here, and these would actually jump around very similar to a flea. Uh, However, uh, there are, especially this time of year with the cool weather, we do get the kind of springtails that don't have the spring. Uh, they're more blue color. They're often associated with water. We also have simple metamorphosis where the adults do have wings. And aphids are a pretty good example of that. Uh, as you can see here, we have, we have an adult that does have wings. However, uh, the, the body before the wings looks a pretty much fairly similar to what wingless aphids look like. Uh, this is also the case with some of the other more uh, well-known, some of the other, some other well-known insects that have simple metamorphosis. Uh, and these are the termites. As you can see, this young termite here, despite the coloration and not having wings, in terms of body shape and mouth part type, it uh, looks an awful lot like the adult, same kind of chewing mouth parts on both the adult and the young termite. Uh, cockroaches are very similar. Their body shape is fairly basic, the same basic shape, except for the adult has wings. Uh, otherwise, and of course, and reproductive parts. But of course, otherwise, it looks fairly similar. This is not necessarily going to be the case with complete metamorphosis. In this case, the insect has a resting stage called a pupa where its whole body form might change entirely from what it looked like when it was a, when it was a larva. Uh, the adult usually has wings in the case of complete metamorphosis. There are a couple cases where there are some parasitic flies that, that used to have wings have adapted to where they no longer have wings, uh, but in most cases we have a winged form. Um, and as I mentioned, the adult may look entirely different from the larva. Also, the adult may live in a diff totally different environment and feed on totally different food than the larva, if the adult even feeds at all. And this becomes important for not only uh, control purposes, but for inspection and for looking for the different, the different places a pest might be. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail as we get some examples. Here's a pretty good example. Uh, now we'll play a, a little game for those that want to play along and want to type in. Does anybody know what this is the larva of? Uh, I'll give you a small clue. This thing lives in an aquatic, a semi-aquatic environment. Um, Tim Daly gets the flea. That's, that's good. That's close. Uh, nope. This one lives in an aquatic environment. So what we have here actually is we have the larva. A snail darter. That's interesting. I, I don't even know what that is, Keith. So that, <laughs> you're you are pretty you're pre, you're a little bit better knowing than what I am that it is. This is actually a, a moth fly, also known as a drain fly, and this is very important because the homeowner generally sees one or the other of these. It does not the homeowner usually sees either the larvae that we saw in our previous slide, and sometimes that happens because uh, when a homeowner when a, someone goes on vacation, if you have a moth or a drain fly, they can lay eggs in the back of the commode. And then when the commode is flushed, all the larvae come in up into the commode with the, with the new water. And this usually freaks homeowners out quite a bit because here they have these little wiggly larvae wiggling around in, in the commode, which doesn't usually go over too well. Uh, if, they, if they don't have a, a situation where that happens, 
then they might see this moth fly. They might see the adult. The adult usually hangs out on the shower wall uh, or the shower curtain or somewhere close by a drain, uh, but won't necessarily be in the drain or in the aquatic water. So in a lot of cases, uh, they may have one but not the other or not associate the fact that they actually have to consider both places. So for control, in this case, although the, the adult is not as important for control, you don't really have to control the adult. Uh, if they do find the adult, they may not make the connection that the actual problem is in the drain rather than outside on the, on the surfaces of the shower or in the, in the kitchen area near the garbage disposal. So it's important to know that you can have an adult and a larva that look entirely different, and the places that they live may not be necessarily be the same. Uh, here we're going to have another example in a moment. This one might even be a little bit more difficult, but for those that want to play along when this does come up, does anyone know what this is? This is an outdoor critter. I'll give you a, another hint. Uh, this is actually a very beneficial critter and lives in the grassy areas, lives in grassy areas. And this looks nothing like the adult that it's going to become. Interesting. <laughs> what fought Godzilla in the movies? Close. Actually, that was Mothra. And lace ring, that's close. And tiger beetle, that's also close. Actually, surprisingly, this is a firefly when the firefly picture comes up. And the interesting thing in this case, the mouth parts are the same between the adult and the larva. However, uh, as you can see, the form looks entirely different. Uh, both of these, in this case, are predatory, although some firefly, lar some firefly adults do not feed at this point. Some actually feed on um, other fireflies. And uh, in general, when I'm not doing an online talk and I can have multiple, more and multiple pictures, I generally also have a picture of a female firefly that's actually eating another male firefly of a different species. What she does is she tricks them. Uh, but in this case, even though they look different, both the adult and the larva feed on the same things. They're both, uh, they are both predatory. And in many cases, they live in a similar environment, although the larva is more often going to be found underneath, say, logs and things than, than, a, than the adult would be, but they're generally going to be in a very similar area. Now, there are some other important insect basics, and a different, in addition to uh, how the insect looks, that's important. And one of these things is that insects are exothermic. That means their internal temperature is influenced by the environment, and this has many implications. Uh, also, insects have an exoskeleton, and that means although there are supports or muscles on the inside and things of that nature, there are some, some semi-hard parts on the inside. The main body support for the insect is its cuticle, is its outside skin, and this is important for mostly, in this case, is uh, control purposes but it can also be in, in, important for other purposes. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, first, we'll talk about the influence of temperature. And there's a lot of differences of temperature on uh, insect behavior and activity. And the first thing is the, the actual activity. When it's cold out, there are some insects that don't move much. And then it's the opposite in some cases. There are some insects that are more adapted to the cool weather. Um, however, uh, the actual warmer weather might even kill them. Um, it also affects their behavior. In this case, for example, here we have uh, a robber fly, a predatory robber fly, and his usual stance is he's going to be usually standing, he or she is usually going to be standing upright looking for prey. In this case, it happened to be a cool day, so this particular robber fly is all stretched out and soaking up some sun rays, warming up his body. So this is a different form of behavior than we might have when it's warm out and the and the fly is actually looking for prey. Um, it can also affect the insect physiology. In some cases, for control, uh, the warmer the temperature is, the more effective your chemical will be. And it'll also affect reproduction. Uh, especially in warmer climates, you might ha have more um, generations of insects that, are, that happen for a particular species just because it's warmer for a longer period of time. It might also, uh, speed up the time it takes from egg to adult. Uh, when it's warmer, some insects will take a much shorter time to uh, reproduce the next generation. Now, temperature can affect control efforts in a couple different ways. Um, the temperature, and this is a really important thing when it comes to control. I'll give you a couple of examples. 
The temperature may be too hot or too cold uh, for activity. Insects won't necessarily be moving to come in contact with insecticides. This is important in a couple cases. Uh, the most, uh, the most, uh, probably the most one that you would be most familiar with would be clover mites. Clover mites don't move around in hot weather. So if a barrier is put down for clover mites in hot weather, they probably won't come into contact with them because they won't be crawling over the area of band of material. They'll be sitting in the grass, not doing much, and uh, therefore they won't come into contact with that barrier in order to get to the home because they won't be moving at all. Um, in the terms of fire ants, uh, which I worked on for a few years, the insect might not even forage for the bait. Fire ants, uh, even though one can often think of fire ants in terms of summer because you see their mounds, they actually don't like to forage uh, when the weather is hot. If the soil temperature is below, uh, below 70 or above 90, um, fire ants won't forage. And in that case, other ants that will forage in the warm weather, if you put down bait during that time, they'll actually pick up the bait instead. And then, therefore, your bait won't be effective, and it isn't the fault of the bait. The bait is actually very effective in itself. The fact is that the ants just aren't collecting it. Also, insect metabolism may slow down or speed up based on uh, temperature. Uh, insects won't necessarily feed as much, and, insect, and pesticide activity may be slower when the, when the temperature is it's cooler. Insects also have an, have, uh, an exoskeleton, as we mentioned before, and this can be important uh, for water regulation. Not all exoskeletons are created equal. Um, some primitive insects especially have poor water regulation, and this can be to your advantage uh, in, in control practices. One of the ways in order to get rid of some of these things, such as springtails, and uh, some of your more uh, temp some of your more humidity sensitive insects is actually just to reduce the humidity. Also to grow the insect has to molt. Uh, because the outside exoskeleton is their main support, they can only go so far, they can only get so large before that skeleton must be discarded and they get a larger one. Um, this process can make the insect vulnerable. It can also be used and disrupted as a means of control. And that's how some particular uh, of some of your growth regulator pesticides work in terms of messing up this process so that when the insect does have to molt, it makes it so that the insect cannot do this properly and continue their growth. Now, basic entomology can help in a lot of different ways. Uh, why do we need to know all this? You know, why do we need to know some of these things, such as how the insect looks and how the insect uh, goes through its life cycle? Well, for one thing, it can make the identification easier. And sometimes even a general idea of what kind of insects you have can make further investigation much easier. And I'm going to give pictures here in a moment when they pop up of an example that I actually got in. I actually got this, uh, I got a picture, I, I, I got an email from a, an extension agent who wanted to know uh, what, 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 why he couldn't find a beetle. Uh, he said he'd looked in a lot of different places. You know, he'd been looking for about two hours for this beetle. So I said, well, send me a picture. And what he sent me was actually this critter down here, which is actually a bug. This is a harlequin bug. And even though it does have a, a hard shell, and there are actually even some more bugs that look even more like beetles, uh, he wasn't going to find this in his beetle book uh, because, of course, it's not a beetle. And it's not going to, the beetle book, being a beetle book, isn't going to mention, oh, by the way, there are actually some bugs that look an awful lot like a beetle. So the best thing to do is to turn the bug upside down and, uh, find the, this piercing, sucking mouth part, and then in that case, now you haven't wasted two hours looking at a beetle book uh, when actually you have a bug for identification. Uh, because, yes, he was right. Uh, the, the insect here, the bug, had a very distinctive pattern, and a, by all means, it should be able to be found easily in a in identification book. And this would be the case if we had a bug book. So sometimes just knowing that little bit of information, uh, knowing you have a fly that has two wings, and even though it looks like an awful lot like a, a wasp, it's actually a fly, can really save you a lot of time and a little bit knowing uh, in terms of knowing what we've got. It can also help in deciding if control efforts are needed. And we have been talked a little bit before at the top of the talk about having damage that's consistent with what you know about the pest and its biology. 
And this here we have, uh, this this is very important uh, for knowing especially what kind of damage you have that a homeowner gives you. Because a homeowner might, is not always the best um, judge of what kind of damage an insect will do. Here we have another example. Uh, here we have actually a, a, an unfortunate tomato in my garden, and we have a caterpillar. And we have the damage here, which is a great big hole. In this case, we know, well, we know caterpillars have chewing mouth parts. So, therefore, we know that, yes, in pretty good case, especially since this thing was all over this, yes, this is particular insect is capable of doing that kind of damage. Uh, basic entomology can help in other ways. Uh, it can help in determining if it's the right time for control efforts. And this generally takes a little bit more knowledge, sometimes in ge than just general knowledge. It actually means you might have to know a little bit about some of the insects themselves, uh, some of the particular species. Um, and the question would be uh, is, are the insects likely to be active? Uh, and that's, of course, a temperature-related thing. Or will the insect's behavior mean success if, is, is, uh, is the treatment is used now? Ah, I see Linwood made it. Hello, Linwood. Uh, I'm glad you made it. Um, as I mentioned to uh, um, your colleague up there, uh, you can also catch up on, yeah, hi, you can catch up on the beginning of my talk. It, we, is a, it is archived, so you can get the rest of that information. Uh, you'll get to get uh, most of the, the parts about uh, of, uh, identification resources. That's what we'll be going into next. Uh, so uh, let's have some examples of some of these things, of how it's important to, con to know what the control efforts we have. And our first example when it comes up is going to be, um, my slides are being slow. Here we go. Here we have euonymus scales. And euonymus scales go through quite a bit of, uh, of differences in, in behavior from small ones to adults. Uh, and what we know about something like euonymus scale is this is a hard scale. And we can tell that based on it. We can see the three different, in this case, we can even see evidence of molting. Here we have when a when a scale molts, it actually leaves behind the different, uh, its different body, its different old shells. And it lives underneath these shells. So what we know for a lot of cases about most scales is, hard scales is, controls such as, say, uh, malathion or, or, you know, some of your dust, some of the things that homeowners like to use are not going to be effective at this stage of their development. You actually have, they're going to be hidden underneath these shells and it's not really going to help. Nowadays, there are some systemics that will work on some of these uh, hard scales. They have changed some of the formulations, although I am not as familiar with them as, say, Will Hudson would be. I still tend to say go with the horticultural oil, which works on all the levels of these. But some of the more things that homeowners are going to be used to using are not going to work on this stage. Uh, the good old, uh, what's that good old stuff that everybody likes to, to shake on there that I don't use in my garden? Uh, that's not going to work on these. Uh, most cases, you have to wait for the crawler stage, which is a major mobile stage of these particular types of uh, hard scales. And that's going to look an awful lot more like, uh, say, you know, what, you would, what you would expect to find for aphids. It's a, it's a scale magnet. Oh, yeah, yes, you're, you're right, yes. <laughs> most of your onomas are a scale magnet, and that is one of the things... That is actually one of the things I tell homeowners quite often. Uh, another one are the boxwoods. Boxwoods are another, are, they'll, they'll look good for about 10 or 11 years and then they start going downhill and homeowners say, well, what's wrong with my boxwood? You know, it's all got, it's got boxwood leaf miners and all kinds of other problems. And basically sometimes I just come right out and tell them, well, the problem is it's a boxwood. It doesn't like living in Georgia. <laughs> that's what's wrong with it. Uh, that's also the case. Uh, so. That's one of the things. Uh, that's one of the things that can be helpful in knowing it, uh, in knowing different kinds of things about uh, general entomology. Another is here we have another example of guilty or not guilty. Here we have a little flea beetle. This is one of another denizens of my garden. And here we have some damage here that we got chewed holes. And the question would be, well, would a flea beetle do this kind of damage? And the answer would be yes. Flea beetles are really good at chewing things up. Uh, but what else do we know about this? Here we have an adult beetle here. What else do we know about this, uh, this because it is a beetle? Um, we know that it has complete metamorphosis. 
And that means in addition to this beetle, we should be also be looking for a larval form of the beetle, which isn't necessarily going to look like the adult, and it may or may not feed in the same places. If I remember correctly from looking in my garden, the, the adults were a whole lot more mobile and oftentimes jumping around on the higher levels of vegetation, whereas in a lot of cases, the younger, uh, the actual, in this case not nip, the larval flea beetles were actually on lower, a lot of lower leaves and in a lot of cases in protected areas. But to get good control, you actually have to control both of these critters, although in my case, I generally use, have fight a losing battle against the flea beetles, and I just uh, get varieties that tend to uh, go ahead and withstand flea beetle uh, chewing, especially my eggplant. Now we're going to quickly go through some other common arthropods. Uh, here we have spiders. Uh, spiders are gender, they're different from insects in that they have two body parts. Uh, one of them is a cephalothorax, which is definitely not as easy to say as head or thorax. And we have the abdomen. Uh, spiders have eight legs, uh, and they're predatory, at least all the ones here. There has been some research that says there might actually be some spiders in tropical areas that feed on seeds, which, if you ask me, is pretty strange. But we don't have any of those kind of spiders. Our spiders, as far as we know, are all predatory. We also have another very common group of arthropods called the daddy long legs. And these look an awful lot like spiders, but they're actually their own group. They're the opalones. They're not the arrhenii. They're a different, uh, they're a different critter altogether. Um, they, here it says it has, here I have here that it has one body part, but actually they do have three body parts. Three body parts are just all fused into one. So for all intents, you know, for what you can see, you actually just see one body part. Uh, they have eight legs, very similar to spiders, but unlike spiders, uh, who if spiders lose their legs, as long as they have not finished uh, their developing, as long as they are going to still molt at least one more time, they'll get their legs back. Standing long legs, however, oftentimes when, once they lose a leg, that's it. Even if they're a small daddy long legs, they do not get back their legs. They do not regain those legs. This is important in that a lot of da daddy long legs that end up getting seen because of this, especially the males who have these really long legs in the front here, um, they're going to have eight legs. They might have seven legs or six legs or even five legs. It's very common. So that's important to note that when you're looking at a daddy long legs, it might not always have eight legs as you're going to find with a spider. Um, another eight-legged critter that we have uh, are the ticks which will be coming up in a minute. Here's a good example of dog tick. Um, also, the mites are actually in the same group. Uh, they're both a carry, both the mites and the ticks. Um, and I should say the adults are going to have eight legs in most of your nymphal stages. However, ticks do have a larval stage, and the larval stage is only going to have six legs. Uh, not only does the larval stage have six legs, uh, they also often don't have the characteristics that are useful, uh, and in this case, some of these are these dentitions here. Uh, they don't have these particular characteristics that, that make identification easier. So oftentimes when you get a larval tick, uh, not only is it doesn't it have these uh, adult characteristics or later nymphal characteristics, oftentimes it's going to be blown up when a homeowner finds it. What happens is, uh, the larval tick comes along, it feeds on something, it gets big, it gets big and round and extended, and it falls off, and then it has to get on a host again. This is a problem. Whenever a tick needs to molt, this is a problem for the tick, it actually falls off the host and it has to wait till it molts to get back on the host again. Um, we had this problem last year with this happening with the larval ticks uh, falling off of dogs. Uh, we had the large ticks ticks coming in with dogs. It was a good year for ticks. The adults would fall off once they fed. They'd lay eggs. The homeowners would get little ticks crawling up the walls because that's what ticks do. They crawl up and they go up. Uh, they would be six-legged, so sometimes it'd be difficult to identify. Others would find the host, the, the host dog, feed on the dog again, and it'd fall off, and then they'd be finding the large engorged little ticks. Actually had quite a few of those last year, cases last year. 
Um, another common arthropod that we will find are the scorpions. Uh, scorpions have ten legs, and their characteristic scorpion stinger. Uh, these will sting. They don't bite like some things. Also, the first two legs are modified into these pinchers. So even though, uh, so they actually only have eight walking legs, but these other two pinchers they have in front are so they have ten all together. Uh, we also have uh, centipedes. Now, the interesting thing about centipedes are centipedes and millipedes are often confused. However, centipedes can be distinguished by having uh, one pair of legs per segment, unless in some cases I see this one here, this guy here lost one of his legs in this thing. And also, uh, they have centipedes have these unfortunate uh, modified uh, chelicera up front, which do have venom. So a centipede will bite. It doesn't sting. Uh, and centipedes will actually readily bite if they're messed with, so it's probably a good idea when you're working in the garden or working in the log pile to be careful of the centipedes. They will bite. It feels pretty much like a bee sting or a wasp sting. Uh, down here, this is the most common of your uh, centipedes. This is a house centipede. Uh, it actually looks a lot, an awful lot more like a millipede than many of the other centipedes because of these long kind of legs. However, it is still quick. It does still have um, the modified chelicera up front, and so it still will uh, bite. Um, what does not bite, uh, what but looks similar to the centipede, are the millipedes. And millipedes can be distinguished by having two pairs per segment of legs, two, le two pairs of legs per segment. However, they're also very slow uh, compared to centipedes, and they will roll up. Uh, they'll roll up defensively. Uh, centipedes do not do this. Uh, they might curl up into, especially some of your smaller, thinner, more fragile types of centipedes, might curl up into different shapes, uh, different S-shaped S -shaped shapes and other kind of wiggly shapes, but they will not curl up like this, uh, where the head is actually protected. And the reason why the head is protected here is it doesn't have any defensive characteristics that allow it to uh, bite. It doesn't have any chelicera, so it's going to be protecting its head. Interestingly, however, uh, millipedes, some millipedes do have um, uh, chemicals that are involved with them, and it's escaping me at the moment what the, the chemicals are, but they're pretty nasty chemicals so that when they uh, get something eats them, uh, they will kind of exude these chemicals, and it actually can be fairly toxic, some of the species. Okay, now we're going to go into the identification resources. I'm going to be going over online resources, sources, uh, which are mostly going to be amateur sites and government-sponsored. Uh, some of those, what I mean by government-sponsored, uh, these are ones that are hosted by universities. That's mostly what I mean. And then I'm going to go over text and bulletins. And mostly these are going to be uh, non-technical uh, because uh, keys, even I don't use keys very often. Uh, the only key that I use consistently is uh, the one for the Beatles, which we'll talk about. In most cases, uh, keys just take a long time um, because they have everything. They've got all the different insects uh, of a particular group, and oftentimes you don't need all those insects because they don't all live in your area. Uh, so in a lot of cases, keys for me just kind of are waste time. So here, what we're, if I've got keys that I like and know how to use, I'll use them. But in most cases, these are the kind of things I use. Okay, here's our first online resource. This is one of the best ones I like to use. It does take a little bit of uh, explanation, though, to use it for, for, to best effect. This is a bug guide. It's an amateur site, but it is visited by a lot of different experts. Um, it often has pictures that, of species that can't be found anywhere else on the Internet. So that's really good for that particular thing. Uh, one moment here. Sorry. Uh, the important thing is to know about this is there are a couple different places on this that are very helpful uh, to help you to narrow things down. Here we have up here. Up here, we've got the ID request. Now, okay, uh, thank you, Johnny. Um, uh, that's duly noted. Um, we have an ID request box here. And the interesting thing to note about this is, uh, in a lot of cases, an ID request, some of them can be identified really quickly. However, um, people on Bug Guard are even more fanatical about bugs than I am, believe it or not. Uh, and some of them really like bugs, and they kind of get really upset if you send them a picture of a squash bug. And they might not be afraid to tell you so. So 
So I would suggest not sending them a squash bug for identification. Um, also, uh, another important thing to look at for another important feature here is the search box. And this is where I put most of my things to look for things uh, when I actually want to look for something. And how specific you get will determine um, what kind of information you get. Here, for example, we'll look at, uh, uh, we'll look at a search that I did. Here is a search for brown marmorated stink bugs. And it's important to note that what comes up here is, uh, if you look over here, you can see some things are not necessarily brown marmorated stink bugs. This is a daddy long leg that's eating a brown marmorated stink bug. So the important thing to note is what I do is I look at all the pictures, and they can sometimes be helpful, very helpful. But then what I'll do is I'll scroll down the page to where you have the matching guides. Now you have different things here. Here you've got, uh, and it gets more specific as it goes along. Depending on how confident you are of your identification, you can either start at the end. You can either start at, okay, I'm pretty sure I have a brown marmorated stink bug, so I'll click on that. Or you can say, well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe I'll try uh, the, the genus. Or even better, maybe I'll try, maybe I'll start with the stink bug. In this case, the next case thing we're going to look at is, here's what you get when you start with the stink bug. And the important thing to note is, you're going to start off on the information over here, what we have. Oops, wrong. Sorry, wrong thing here. Let's clear that off. Beep, beep. Uh, what you're going to start with is you're going to start with on the info tab. And the important thing about the info tab is it's going to give you information on the entire group. And it's only going to give you a few pictures that represent the entire group. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to hit the browse button here. And the browse button is very important because it's going to give you all kinds of other information you might not get otherwise. This is what happens when you hit the browse button. In this case, it gives you some distinctions of subfamily. In other cases, it'll give, go right to genus. Um, and then what happens is, as you go to the subfamily, when you click on that, it's going to give you a few representatives of each genus. Now, there's also an images, an images tab up here. I suggest you stay away from the images tab until you get close to the end because that's going to give you tons and tons of pictures and it can be very bandwidth eating up. And sometimes it takes a lot of, and it gives lots of pictures. It gives all the images. So if I were you, I would start out with the browse button. And that's what it, this is an extremely helpful um, resource for identification because it gives you a couple pictures of each different group if it has them. And then you can go ahead and take a look at those and see, okay, maybe I've got this, maybe I don't. Now we're going to look at uh, bugwood. I'm not going to say too much about bugwood uh, because most of the cases I go directly to forestry images because that's my favorite one. So here we have forestry images. Now here's our. Oh, this also has a search box, and I'm going to show you the same. We're going to show you the same search that I did on Bug Guide. What what comes up for forestry images? Now for forestry images, it's going to put the most relevant things at the top, the most relevant pictures at the top here, and then they get less and less relevant or, a, for example, this particular brown marmorated stink bug actually turned up 10,000 different results because it actually also put in other stink bugs near the bottom. So it starts out with the most relevant ones. Uh, the pictures on here are generally larger, so that's the advantage of, of uh, forestry images. You get to look at larger pictures than you do in Bug Guide. Bug Guide is limited to only, because they have so many photos, they can only do so, so large or so small. You're also more likely to get pictures of uh, different stages, although you also get that in Bug Guide, and damage. Now I'm going to, this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty um, specific site for moth. Uh, this is one that I do like. Uh, it's called Moth Photographers Group. And you can find it by Googling Moth Photographers Group, uh, generally all one word. Uh, the thing is that you kind of have to know a little bit about what you're doing here, and that can be a problem. So we're going to give a little bit of advice at the end of this. Here the important thing is what we call this plate series here. When you click on the plate series, this, here, this is what you're looking at here is the home page. When you click on the plate series, here you get, this is where you get all your plates. And these are, are organized in terms of family, moth family, which that's why, as I said, this can be a little bit daunting in that you have to kind of have an idea what family you are or what kind of family you're looking at. The important thing to note on this is here you have pin specimens, and over here you have live specimens, and you have what's called a slow and a fast. 
What that generally means are your slow pages mean that you have four examples of each moth, and they can eat up bandwidth pretty good. And here you have your fast ones that only have one moth, uh, one moth representative for each species. You even this is even further subgrouped down into what they call low, large, medium, and small pages. Depending on you can you can adjust it to whatever bandwidth. Your, how fast your computer is, you can either click on the large pages, the medium pages, and small pages. The important thing to note is a page might have, if you go down to the bottom of the page, there might be a one and a two. There might be continuations of that page, so keep note of that. Here's an example of what it looks like. Here we have a pyralid, uh, and here this is what you call one of the uh, slope, the one of the one of the fast pages that only has one moth per one moth per each species. However, as you get closer, you can click on to uh, what here in this case, this is a meal moth. If you click on the number, the Hodges number, you'll get a whole bunch of different examples of that species, including the pin specimen. So, however, uh, in most cases, even for me, I don't always know what family is. Here's another helpful uh, website. This is called UK Lepidoptera, and it's going to have uh, your representatives of your families, which might help. And here we go. Uh, uh, it's, uh, Johnny Wooden said he had to leave at 10 of. Hopefully he, uh, oops, I should have said before that he can read the archive if he needs to. Uh, this is what the page is going to look like when you call it up right here. This is what the, the home page is going to look like. What you're going to want to do, there's two different things here. Here we have this, uh, this link, which takes you to here, which takes you to the families. There's also a link, which I have not used yet, but I suppose it would be really helpful. There's also a link to different kinds of damage that takes you to different kinds of families based on what kind of damage on the leaf you have. So this is a really interesting site. Even though it is um, mostly British Lepidoptera, in general, the families can be, still be really helpful because they still look fairly similar. So you can get a pretty good idea. This might help you with your families to help you get into one of the more specific um, sites later on. Here we have, now what happens if you have caterpillars? Well, if you have caterpillars, then you can go to here, Caterpillars of Eastern Forest, which I've given you the, the link up here. The unfortunate thing for this is this does not have a whole, it only has some represent, representative caterpillars, mostly um, your most common kind, but it's not going to have all the different caterpillars. What you're going to find when you look at here, if you scroll down, if you click, if you scroll down, you're going to find the different families of caterpillars. And here we've clicked on the silk moths, and here's what some of the different ones, some of the different caterpillars. You can click on these different um, thumbnails to get an idea. However, in most cases, it will probably, as with the moths, and unless you're fairly sure, or with the caterpillars, it's probably best to send me the, the critter or the pitcher in case of the moths and, and with caterpillars, a pitcher is usually pretty good for me, almost better than a, a, a dead specimen in alcohol, especially with the moths. Uh, because it can be pretty tricky, and we're going to go into, if you really like this kind of thing, we're going to go into some books later that can be helpful. All right, here's another key. Uh, we'll have to go, I'm running out of time here, so I'll have to go with some pretty quick here. Uh, this is a key, and if you go back in the archives, this is a key for, for yellow jackets. I actually have a really good um, pamphlet that helps me identify yellow jackets, but if you want to try it yourself, you can. Uh, this is the gets you to the home page, and then this is how you have to get to the actual keys for the yellow jackets. They can be pretty helpful, and I have used these keys on a, a few occasions. Um, here we have this is something new I've added. Here's a key to the columbula, and here's a here's how you get them. And this actually will take you through. It's actually a pretty helpful key. Uh, it's it's a kind of a subset of a larger uh, there. If you if you Google columbula, you'll actually get here Franz Jensen's page on columbo, which is pretty amazing. I mean, it's got all kinds of really good information on there if you actually have time to look for those things. Now let's go through some of the books. Uh, this here is my large group of books. I actually don't use a lot of these books too often. I do use them, but at the end of the thing here, you'll see which ones I, here are the ones I use most often. Uh, here's the MPCA Field Guide to Structural Pests. It's actually now the national, it's now the MPMA. Uh, and here is a good place that they're used that they are actually uh, available, and this says, hopefully this link still works, that they're available for $69.95. I found one on PCT, which is Pest Control Technology, that they were selling for $99.95, so if they're actually available from the National Pest Management Association for that price, that's a really good price. What I like about this resource is it goes through the, the insects and sections, and it actually has 
things that, if it, that, that look like the insect you're interested in. For example, if you have a carpet beetle, it'll say other insects that look like carpet beetles, and it'll give an example of a whole bunch of them, and then it'll tell you how to tell them apart. So that's what I like these. This is also my favorite resource for identifying flies because it does draw a lot in the cases, the draw the wings and have the wing venation, which is my main thing that I use for flies. This is a really good book. Uh, this is it basically for the price, it's the best. I use it quite often. Uh, it's only about, if I remember correctly, about the $30 or $35 or even less sometimes online. For the price, uh, there, there are few resources that go through garden insects that are, that are better. Uh, I use it quite often. Um, here's another one. This is really good, but as you can see, the price is not cheap. It's fairly steep. It's available from Cornell University Press. Uh, and, but it is very helpful in a lot of cases, giving this great uh, index in terms of uh, hosts, and it's great pictures, and, and I do use it quite often, especially for uh, your, especially for scale insects. Um, this book is actually now back in print. It's my go-to book when I get grubs. It has a great grub identification. It's now available uh, here at this website. However, I will warn you, it is not inexpensive. It's, if I remember correctly, it's over $50. So it is not a cheap book. However, it is my go-to resource for grubs and for a lot of the turf grass insect pests. Um, this is my favorite book for spiders. If you Google it, Spiders of the East United States, it's approximately $28. Uh, I like it because even though it's not the technical book, it's not the one that has the keys, it has pictures of probably 90% of the spiders I get in are pictured in this book. It's definitely picture orientated. It's not keys. Uh, it's definitely one you go through, ah, here's my spider. And for me, this helps because I really prefer pictures of living, in, of living critters than I do to drawings, and especially line drawings without color. This, for me, is definitely my go-to book for spiders. Ah, here we have the NCDC keys. These are old as the hills. However, when it comes to tick identification, this is my go-to resource. Um, I have a paper version here, but there are two places that these can be found online. Uh, the second one, the government one, is does a little bit better in terms of knowing what you're looking for. The difference is that uh, uh, this, top, this top one has larger sections. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't necessarily say what the sections are. This bottom one says, breaks it up into, you know, ticks, mites, uh, bed bugs, et cetera. However, it only gives you small chunks at a time. So it depends on what you're interested in. Uh, these are online resources are both free, and so you can find the keys on that. How to know the beetles? I use these quite often. Um, it's very helpful for me. This is one of the few keys that works. And then once I go through these key, this key, um, unfortunately, this key, even though it's very useful, it only has line drawings in it. So once I've got a pretty good idea, okay, I think this is the family I've got. And the, also the unfortunate thing is the uh, beetle families have recently been changed around a lot. So eh, then sometimes I have to go to Bug Guide because Bug Guide keeps up on the, the families have been switched around for beetles. Uh, I also use that once I've keyed it out, I use this Peterson Field Guide, or if I have a pretty good idea, I use this Peterson Field Guide, which has, then it has pictures. Uh, they're not real pictures or colored drawings, but at least they're, uh, they, they've got, at least they've got color and uh, they've got more information. So I use both of those together. Okay. Let's see. Where are we? Ah. This is interesting. These I use for caterpillars, and we actually have a brand new book here. Uh, David Wagner's Outlet Caterpillars have come out, and the reason why it's changed is uh, they changed the Noctuid family around. So now this includes other families. Noctuids have broken up. This includes all, some of those families. It's missing one. Uh, I think it's the Nododonids that aren't in there, the original Nododonids. Uh, but anyway, the Outlet, ca the outlet Caterpillars, uh, it's a really good book. Um, it, for the price, it's $35. Uh, it has over 2,000 photographs. Um, this one is that. This one also ha is a pretty good value. This one is only a five by eight book, though. This is actually eight by ten. So even though they look similar in size and pages, this one actually has a, a more has more stuff in it, uh, be just because it's bigger. Now it is only focused on those, whereas this is a more general and has other moths in addition to the owlets, but. 
really good, really good value for the price. And lastly, here are, is my uh, my go-to ant uh, identification. It's fairly cheap, only 9.95 available at that there. And this is why I use the, the the ant key in there is really good. Uh, so any questions? Uh, I know we don't have much time left. Uh, that we're all both glad of time. But if there are any questions, I'll be around. And here's here are my go-to my main go-to books. As you can see, it's a pretty small section. These are ones I use most often. And thank you for everybody listening. And uh, I'll let you go if you want to go. I'll be here for questions if you want to have questions. Uh, thank you very much.